So <clears throat> happy birthday, John Haydock. He was one of the uh, New York Five, uh, the Whites, as they were called, Richard Meyer, Charles Guizmi, Peter Eisenman, Michael Graves, and John Haydock. Um, Louis Kahn called them Playboy architects. But we'll, uh, we'll arrive at, uh, at, at more about this. He was also a very important dean uh, of a very important architecture school in New York, uh, Cooper Union. He was for many years the dean in that school. So John Quentin uh, Haydock, as you see, born uh, July 19th, 1929, was an American architect, artist, and educator of Czech origin who spent much of his life in New York City. Haydock is noted for having had a profound interest in the fundamental issues of shape, organization, representation, and reciprocity. Haydock studied at the Cooper Union School of Art and Architecture, the University of Cincinnati, and the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He worked in several offices in New York, including that of IMP and Partners, and the office of A.M. Kinney and Associates. He established his own practice in New York City in 1965. Haydock uh, was professor of architecture at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art School of Architecture from 1964 to 2000, so for 36 years, and dean of the School of Architecture from 1975 to 2000, 25 years, he was the leader of that very important architecture school. It was important and it is important because it is, I think, the only school in the United States that is free. You don't pay anything to study there, but you have to pass a difficult exam. But exam, but we enter, but some very bright people enter in that school. His arrival, including the cooperation of many other influential professors, including Raymond Abraham, Ricardo Scofidio, Peter Eisenman, Charles Guidme, Diana Agres, Diane Lewis, Elizabeth Diller, David Shapiro, Don Wall, and many others, transformed the practice and critical thought of architecture in ways that might be compared to Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's transformation of the Armour Institute into the Illinois Institute of Technology, a flattering uh, comparison. So this was the man, the Czech of uh, Czech uh, ancestry, uh, a big man. Uh, Daniel Lipskin was one of his uh, darlings at the Cooper Union. And uh, Here he is with some uh, students and professors. I, I don't recognize uh, any face besides uh, his. Anyway, an excellent school, truly a very good, uh, a very good school. Very free, very poetical, very experimental, very, very, very. Here he is also inside the, the Cooper Union. So again, he was the dean of this school for 25 years. That's not a little time at all, a short time at all. And some drawings by him. He's, uh, he said that he was influenced by Le Corbusier, by uh, Mondrian, by the, the Stiel, Theo van Dusburg. There are influences, uh, various kinds of influences in his work. He's not so important, in my opinion, through his built work, but through his drawn and painted work work. Uh, he published some very exquisite uh, books uh, which promote architecture, some kind of uh, poetic act. And his books are very beautiful, actually. But his built work, in my op opinion, is problematic. And I will, I will uh, try to verbalize uh, my, my opinion about this. But the, the, the New York Five, they all had an interest in, well, most of them, Peter Eisenman as well, uh, Michael Graves also drew a lot. Uh, th there was uh, an interest in, in the graphic aspect, aspects of architecture. They promoted uh, an abstract understanding of architecture, much more abstract than we are accustomed to. 
Now, a, a house he built in the Netherlands, the so-called Wall House number two. So again, why are we talking about John Haydar today? Because he was born on the 19th of July. So this is, uh, this is the house that um, the Dutch uh, invited him to build and it was built. Uh, it, it doesn't seduce me a lot. Uh, it, it is distinctly his, but uh, you know, it, it's rather, I would say a formalistic uh, building a little bit contrived for my for my uh, um, understanding, and not to speak about the, the affectation of you know you lift uh, these um, these uh, floors, these these um, yeah these floors, uh, you know you separate them, and of course there is a lot of uh, unnecessary expenditure here, not to speak about losses of energy. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe he was not concerned. And I think he was not concerned with such issues, at least at the time when he, uh, when he built this. I don't even think it is uh, very handsome, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I nevertheless commemorate him. There is a certain bi-dimensionality in his work. That is the graphic aspects of architecture are sometimes uh, overwhelming other aspects. And um, I think this is detrimental to, to the building. This is the old building of the Cooper Union, it was not built by him, but, but he, when he was dean, he, he uh, did work within the building uh, you know, refurbished and uh, some, some uh, you know, new design within the building. Back to, um, to his house, the house he built in the Netherlands. In my opinion, it's not even very playful. I mean, it's some kind of a contrived playfulness. But, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it was an experiment and we should take it as such. It's also very possible that it was abandoned or I mean, it, it doesn't quite look like it, it, it is inhabited at least when this picture was taken. I imagine here was supposed to be a door and it's not any longer. Anyway, um, Uh, so uh, this is what Kenneth Frampton uh, wrote about John Haydock, that he specializes in frontality. Well, this is in a way what I meant when I said that the graphic aspects, the bidimensionality of the work is the one that seems to be uh, of the main concern for him. So let's read what Frampton said, a starting point for discussing the deflection of the vocabulary of Le Corbusier towards Haydock's own design intentions can perhaps be provided by the idea of the promenade, which was important to Le Corbusier. According to Le Corbusier, movement provides continuously changing visual fields within an architectural visual horizon that is constant over at least part of the trajectory. Thus, variety is set within one or more clearly perceived organizing frameworks. In the wall house, the one we just saw, movement is associated with a visual field that changes only minimally within a given horizon, as in the approach corridor or with abrupt changes of the horizon of reference as when the wall is crossed. The interplay between the changing shapes of visual fields according to incremental changes of local position and the relatively constant horizon is negated. One might argue that the landscape outside the house is the horizon of reference from the three living spaces. However, even this horizon is disassociated from the spaces that channel movement. The world house can indeed be read as a handling of movement that is equivalent to an anti-promenade. 
if Le Corbusier's design invites us to understand how controlled changes of views are produced as local variations of an underlying structure, Haydock provides an aggregation of segmented views that instead defies synthesis. To achieve the qualities of promenade, Le Corbusier fundamentally works with three-dimensional space. Kenneth Frampton says that Haydock specializes in frontality. Anyway, um, so yes, it's about the allowing graphics or bidimensionality to take over the building. And yet it is a building that uh, invites discussion. And as you can see, <laughs> there are lectures about it and so on. And even I try to say something about it. This is a, a project he did for a church um, back to, to the World House. Now, this is a kind of an interesting work that uh, it was a commemorative work for this Czech student who, uh, uh, you know, uh, sacrificed his life when the Russians, when the Soviets entered Prague, and he was uh, he uh, self-immolated himself. Uh, he, uh, I mean, he 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 he, he uh, put himself to fire, so to speak, and and he died. And John Haydock, uh, who was of Czech uh, ancestry, um, created this memorial with two houses, actually. One is the house of the mother of the suicide, and one is the house of the suicide. So you have two houses, the house of the mother of the suicide and the house of the suicide. I'm not going to read this uh, text because uh, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's it's, I, I don't usually like to read long texts uh, during the presentations, but I, I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, now, uh, well, I, I'll arrive at, at, the, at, the, at the two houses built in Prague a little bit later. Now we look at other things. The thing is, he, in his case, the graphic works and the built works um, you know, it, it, they create sometimes uh, tension in the sense that there is no, um, I don't know how to say, most architects have a chronological history of, uh, of their buildings. But in the case of Haydak, who didn't build a lot, uh, you know, here he has some scattered buildings here and there, and then a lot of uh, graphic works and so on. Now, the conventional architect will say these are not buildings. And in a way, it is true. They are not buildings. They are rather installation. But I remember what I attended a lecture by, by Haydock where he says, said that uh, uh, Peter Eisenman once uh, asked him, well, well, John, where is the entrance into the building? Because you know, uh, there was no entrance in one of his uh, projects. And uh, he said, you cannot enter in that building. And, and uh, John Haydock apparently said, you can't, John. You can't, Peter. But I don't think it's so simple. I think there is a problem in the name of speculation, speculative, uh, you know, philosophical, uh, uh, you know, meanderings. Uh, you neglect some basic realities of what architecture is. And but but this being said, he was very an excellent educator. And Cooper Union at the time when he was a dean was considered actually the best architecture school in the world that provided uh, that uh, you know culminated in a bachelor degree. Uh, and they published two books uh, with uh, with um, architecture with with the works of the students of the school. A very interesting school, actually. But it is true that this kind of installations, uh, most of the time, um, you know, architects consider it as not being architecture. But on the other hand, I have to tell, that, tell you that uh, I attended a lecture where Jeff uh, Kipnis, an important theoretician from the United States, this he said at the end of the 20th century that at that time he thought 
John Haydock was the most important architect in the world. I don't think it's true. I, 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 uh, but uh, his statement, I think, referred to the fact that he brought a new vision about uh, the intellectual, um, cultural role of the architect. And that, I think, is needed. But what he built, in my opinion, is, 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 is uh, problematic, to say the least. Anyway, the house of the of the suicide and the house of the mother of the suicide. Now the uh, this is in uh, in uh, in Compostela in Galicia, uh, a socio cultural center. It's this building which um, uh, I don't know what to say about it. This one is is more like a building indeed, but there are certain ag aggressive uh, elements here. You know the this, the way this balcony is pierced uh, this facade and he has something similar here too but uh, you know this these are uh, some sketches for the building uh, which was built his drawings are interesting and personal and uh, he, he continuously investigated architecture uh, starting with drawings but he also wrote poems uh, and his books are indeed very, very nice. Even if they don't show built works, but drawn works, graphic works relating to architecture. Uh, this is a building in Berlin. We are going to, well, this also, uh, I, I, should, I should organize a little bit this material and I, I apologize. These are uh, apartment buildings he built in Berlin in the 80s, 1980s. Not far away from here is the Jewish Museum by his uh, darling, uh, Daniel Lipskin. These buildings were actually on the verge of being demolished, but uh, the community of the architects protested and they were saved. They're strange. I mean, even this one, you know, this is almost like a face, you no? Know? And uh, you know, this is not encouraged uh, usually to, to do the sloping uh, uh, roof in this way towards the center of, uh, of the house. So he built both the lower height buildings, this one, and this one and the tower. You see all three of them here. Uh, John Haydock in, uh, in uh, Berlin. The cat house, you know, somebody, not me, uh, you know, uh, allow himself or herself to be humorous about um, this facade of the building. Now a house for two brothers, also built by him, also in, uh, in Berlin. But uh, we'll arrive at the pictures a little bit later. Uh, well, no, actually, it's, this is the, the naming of the school, of the, of the building in English, and this is in, uh, in German. But this is, this is actually what we are looking at. You know, the house for two brothers. And indeed, there are two houses with a very strange plan, and you are going to see it. The Kretzberg Tower, you already saw, but we are going to see other pictures. With it is that tall tower that uh, we previously saw. And now in some more artistic, so to speak, pictures. Uh, this is a different work. This was built after he died. Uh, and uh, I think uh, he, the one who pushed for this work to be built was Peter Eisenman, uh, because Peter Eisenman built a large uh, uh, building the next to this. We are going to see more pictures of this. This is in Santiago da Compostela in, in Spain. 
So these two towers were designed by John Haydock, but built later um, after he died. They're interesting, you know, here we have again two nests, the double. We have two structures that seem to be identical. The only thing that differentiates them is actually the, you know, this is uh, transparent, this is opaque. Uh, but otherwise the geometry of the, of, of, the, of the towers is identical. It's actually an interesting idea. You know, you, you have two things that are identical, but the there is a difference. And the difference is in the treatment of the walls, of the facades, of uh, you, 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 you can create a, a multiplicity in unity. John Haydock in uh, Santiago da Compostela. This is a very nice picture indeed. Now, this is an installation which does not belong to him, of course, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I think, uh, you know, when you have uh, um, uh, an architectural idea that is infused with, uh, you know, uh, various uh, interesting so-called concepts, then uh, inevitably afterwards, some, some interesting things could happen and do happen at least sometimes within the buildings. Concerts also, but this, this is, I mean, we look at the buildings by John Haydock, but uh, actually the, you know, the performers are on top of the building by Peter Reisenman, which you probably know. So again, this is by John Haydock, but what you see here is actually the, the landscape architecture of, uh, of Peter Eisenman. Here also, Peter Eisenman. Peter Eisenman and John Haydock. John Haydock, this is what he said. What is decisive about his work now? It, it couldn't be like by him, but about him. I mean, it's not by him, but it's about him. What is decisive about his work is that it leads to a different place on which is both alien and inalienable, a place which consecrates architecture with mysteries that are no longer decipherable within the ordinary code of my messy or my messy. This is an installation, I think, in, uh, in Oslo. I, there is something medieval in his work, but when I, when I say his work, I refer mainly to um, installations. There is theater, the, the performing arts, um, there is sculpture, there is uh, installation, there is uh, architecture to an extent. There are various things that collaborate here. Sorry about that picture. I don't know why it's, uh, it's like that. Drawings, drawing sketches by him. Here there are four of the uh, New York Five on the left, Peter Eisenman. Then here is uh, uh, this is Richard Meyer. This is Michael Graves and Charles Whitney. And uh, probably John Haydock uh, took the uh, took the picture. One of the the covers of one of his books, Mask of Medusa. I think Haydock is important for underlining something that unfortunately is forgotten often. 
and that is that architecture is a cultural uh, enterprise. Uh, it's, a, it's a cultural uh, activity. And uh, unfortunately, in the act of so-called uh, building and so-called being realistic, we forgo this many times. Uh, and we shouldn't. Uh, he's, uh, he also has very interesting ideas about urbanism because he invents new functions. Uh, you saw the numbers. And each number referred to a certain kind of building, a certain typology. And some, some of them are very interesting because they are not common at all. I hope I, we arrive at, uh, later at some uh, uh, pages with uh, notations about this. An installation in some museum, I don't know where it is, maybe, maybe in Oslo. The Mask of Medusa in Buenos Aires, 1998. Again, this is a speculative architecture. And uh, I personally think that uh, respecting the specificities of architecture would uh, refresh us to bring back to architecture what in English is called speculative. Because otherwise, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, Wolf Frick said, if you only think of architecture, you only get architecture. In a way, architecture becomes more alive and more complex when it assumes other levels of uh, you know, intellectual inquiry, uh, uh, when it assumes other dimensions of life, not just those strictly having to do with uh, functionalism or with uh, realism or whatever. This is the, the cover of a book published by Cooper Union, one of the two, maybe they published three, I, I, only, I only saw two. Education of an architect, which was very important for that school. And uh, it was very, very experimental. Um, and it covered 10 years of activity. I mean, uh, 10 years of the activity of the school. You see the Erwin Channing uh, School of Architecture of the Cooper Union, and uh, he was the dean. Some important architects uh, taught there, some of them studied there, like uh, himself, and then uh, Elizabeth Diller and uh, Daniel Lipskin and others. Cemetery for the Ashes of Thought. Um, Drawings, many drawings. This is uh, from a book which I actually have. Here there are the, the, the New York Five, uh, which are, I mean, they're actually six because Charles Greedy Siegel, Siegel, there are two in partnership. And then here is John Haydock, Peter Eisenman, Michael Graves, no, um, uh, Richard Meyer and Michael Graves. And I, I, I really think, you know, such groupings should happen in our country as well. You know, uh, I mean, not in a forced way, but it, what, I'm, what I'm saying is architects should also investigate new horizons of, uh, within architecture and uh, through also exploring connections between architecture and other fields. So it doesn't matter where you are, in Brasov, in Bucharest, in Timisoara, in Sigetu uh, Marmaci, uh, whatever. It's, it's, I, 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 I advocate the idea to, to, to enliven the, 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 the life of architecture, wherever you are, through contributions which are not necessarily uh, derived from uh, having a commission. Like these people, they did a lot of, this, that's why it's so important as theoretical work, theory. Because of course you, you cannot remain only at the level of theory. Theory is, is supposed to become practice, but, but a practice without theory is often empty and banal, if not mediocre. You need theory, you need, uh, and you need that, that exuberance. And these people, you know, even now, like this man, Peter Eisenman, He's 89 this year. He's studying at 89 with Ardor Alberti. I find it beautiful. You know, I mean, this is, this is extremely important that, that, that we uh, immerse ourselves within the culture, not the only of architecture, but culture in general, and uh, find inspiration, uh, this impetus is extremely important. 
otherwise you you, you could just uh, give up or you know you, you just become a little technician who solves technically some problems you know uh, i even wonder how how well uh, but uh, you don't contribute these people wanted to change the world in a way you know maybe not very profoundly louis Kahn was critical of them but still even today they represent uh, a unique moment in the in, in 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 the history of modern architecture and um, you know we don't do this sort of thing they do it we don't do it and the question is why don't we do it because we deprive architecture of its um, uh, transformative quality this is why i keep saying the architect is not a prestator de servicio. The architect is a, an agent of transformation of life and society. Thus, an architect would make proposals for so-called changing the world. Of course, the, the world does not allow itself to be changed so easily. But the attempt, I think, is necessary. Because then you, you feel uh, your cause is worthy. You feel... Uh, you feel accomplished to an extent, even if you don't build, but you contribute to a new vision about life, about architecture. You make uh, projects, proposals. You are alive as opposed to be dead. So here they are. Again, John Haydock, Peter Eisenman, Richard Meyer, uh, Michael Graves, who died. I mean, out of these people, I think, uh, only Charles with me is, uh, is alive, maybe Siegel too, and Peter Eisenman. But, uh, oh no, Richard Meyer as well. But John Haydock died, Michael Graves died. Well, the other three are all over 80. Uh, maybe Richard Meyer is over 90. Uh, they are still alive. Anyway, John Haydock, Dean at the School of Architecture, 25 years. He has very interesting drawings, you know, with angels, with strange animals, with poems. But that's what he advocated. He advocated uh, architecture as a cultural act. I mean, how many of architects in our country today draw like this? I don't know of any, actually. Although we could, but but we are not encouraged, we were not encouraged to think that this is architect. Maybe you, I mean, look at this. These are, these are studies, uh, architectural studies of possible buildings inspired by Japanese woodcuts. I think they are very nice. Uh, and the, the Cooper Union, they explored all kinds of uh, things, sometimes crazy things. But as uh, Albert Einstein said, for an idea which doesn't seem first to be, uh, to be uh, mad, uh, there is no hope. We need the madness of experimentation. We need the madness of otherness. Otherwise, we are complacent with a déjà vu. When I think of the more than 10, 15,000 architects in Romania, how much talent there is there, ability to draw, how many ideas, how many imaginations. And many of them, I think, die in a drawer or in, a, in inactivity. Because, of course, society doesn't encourage you to, this, to do this kind of drawing. You have to allow your uh, love for architecture and your artistic side to manifest itself. Just like as a painter, a painter paints without no one asking him to paint, the architect should do the same. Do architecture, even if no one asks you to do architecture. Okay, you cannot build for a while, but paradoxically, these people who did a lot of drawings, apparently useless drawings, they actually also built a lot. Maybe a little bit less uh, John Haydock, but even he built, as you saw, and you will see some other things. So it pays. If you bring to the world uh, your inner life and express your, your longings, your imagination, sooner or later something will happen. But you should not fall into inactivity and indifference, and which leads to you know, all kinds of monsters. 
anyway, um, I like his drawings. <laughs>